All right, you can be seated. Uh, good morning, Bedrock family. Um, it is Easter morning. Today we celebrate the resurrection. Um, we're going to talk about Jesus, and specifically we're going to celebrate the fact that Christ is risen um, and he reigns. And so that is the best news that we've ever received today. Today is about hope. I'm looking forward to talking about it. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 24. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we have them available for you um, around, I think, at the end of the aisle. Uh, there's a Bible for you. So Luke chapter 24, we're going to go verse 1 through 12. Um, if you are a guest, welcome. My name is Drew. I'm one of the pastors here. One of the things that, um, one of the things that we do is we uh, teach together. So Brian and I get to pastor together, and so we kind of alternate teaching. And so this morning is my honor to bring the word. Um, our series, our short series, uh, we have titled um, Death to Life. Um, and it, it's been a sweet couple weeks where we have just sat um, in anticipation for something that is coming. And so there has been all of these pictures that are around here are the Stations of the Cross. Um, and there, has, there was a Sunday, two Sundays ago, where we just sat in the reality that Jesus died for us. And what does that mean? And we kind of sat with every step. So it was a quiet Sunday. Um, but then there was the next Sunday where Brian just sat in the idea of the cross. And we, we've been dealing with it through this perspective of two different questions. Uh, the first question is, why did Jesus have to die? And the second question is, why does Jesus have to come back to life? Um, and I think one of the things that is helpful if you, if you deal with this two Sundays at a time um, is that you get to um, look at first the bloody cross and then the empty tomb, and you feel this dissonance. Um, dissonance is um, the meaning. So it, it means it's something that is, uh, it's an uncomfortable state of mind that occurs when something is unresolved. So, for example, if I were to stop talking right now, over time, about probably one minute, you would feel dissonance. There, was this, there would be this sense of like, Longing for something else to be said. Um, and I think we, um, we don't often feel this in our culture. We don't embrace it. That's for sure. Um, when we have questions, we ask Google or whoever is in your home listening at all times. Um, when we need stuff, we ask Amazon and we click a button. And within a day, now sometimes yeah, that day, within an hour, it's there. Um, when we drive places, we, we go in the fast lane and when we get to Somewhere like Disney World, you get a fast pass, you know, and it's just like, I, it's just, we are in a culture of solutions. That is, we have questions, and very quickly, we appease those questions with answers. Uh, and that's not always a bad thing, but I think um, in some areas of our lives, dissonance and sitting in the waiting can be okay. Um, because the problem is that when we skip an uncomfortable anticipation brought by an unresolved question, we rob ourselves of a process of discovery that leads to a depth in conviction and a new appreciation for what is true. So when you're immediately given the answer, sometimes that answer over time is found to be something that doesn't have the depth that it would have if it's something that you took the time to discover on your own. And so these past couple weeks, we've sat in the cross, and I just can't get this idea out of my mind of what did the disciples feel between the cross and the empty tomb. Um, and, and so I think um, this morning, I guess all that to say, I'm glad that you're here. You may be at a place um, where you have questions of your own, and I think that's okay. Um, I would encourage you to come back over the next couple weeks as we talk about who Jesus is through the book of Mark. I think you'll find comfort in the fact that today, the first thing that we're going to look at um, is that questions, at least for Peter, there were questions before conviction. And ultimately, there was a risen Christ. And out of that comes hope. So let's read our passage. Luke chapter 24, we're going to go verses 1 through 12 says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Taking the spices they had prepared, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. They remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. They did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping, looking in. He saw that the linen cloths by themselves and went home marveling at what had taken place. Let me pray for us. Father, this is, um, this is a precious word that you've given us. Lord, it is a precious story that we hold, that the entire weight of our faith is, is put upon and it holds it up. Lord, that as we look at the cross and today as we look at the empty tomb, Lord, as we have sat with death and today we see life, um, Lord, I pray that you would in us, that your spirit would bring out that life that only you can bring. Lord, I pray that there, if there's anyone in here today that needs to hear the gospel message, Lord, that it would resonate in a way that you have made it to, you've made it to that it would create in us something brand new there would be something new that comes from this morning, this Easter. We're grateful for the empty tomb. Your name, amen. All right, so um, Jesus followers. We've been working our way through the book of Mark, um, and it's been a while. We've been in about a year, and we're getting to uh, the Passion Week, so we're getting to the final week. But one of the things that we see here um, is that Jesus followers, uh, no one actually expected Jesus to die. Now, Jesus had told them, if he would been with us and Mark, Jesus had told them many times, um, over and over again, I am going to be delivered over to the hands of men, I am going to suffer, and I'm going to die, and in three days, I'm going to raise again. It was not because Jesus didn't tell them, it's because they didn't understand who he was, didn't understand what he was meant to do. And so you can see, even in this scene, that people didn't expect him to die, and there's mourning. Even in the book of John, when they describe, they describe where the apostles are after the cross and before the tomb, it says that they were in their homes because they were fear, there was fear of the Jews. They were like, well, then what's going to happen to us if our leader dies? And so they find, they're here in this house, and you see the women. The women take spices. And so spices were something that were meant, to, um, meant be, for the decay of the body, which begins very quickly. And so they're like, we're going to go, and we're going to treat the body as we should. And so the biggest concern is not that you see here, but I think in the book of Matthew is that their question was, how are we going to move the stone? It's a big stone. Their biggest concern was not whether or not the body would be there. Um, And so the question is, how are we going to move the stone? And what what you get all along the way is that hope is lost. It's lost. Um, I think... You see in the very next story, in the next couple of verses, we're not going to read them today, um, the whole story. But if you were to take the time to read them, you see an interaction between Jesus and a couple of disciples. And one of their responses in verse 19 says, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet. This is now his disciples speaking about Jesus. He says, he was a prophet indeed, in word before God and all the people And how our chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. And he said, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. It's gone. Like there's this sense of like a dead Messiah is no Messiah at all. Um, And you remember the conversations that were had. You remember the conversations that were had between Jesus and Peter and Jesus and John and Jesus and his disciples, where they said, you realize we've left everything to follow you. And now they're here in this moment with a lack of hope, thinking, it's done. Like, it's gone, and everything that I had, I had given up to follow this person that was going to be the Messiah, 
but in the end, he's dead. Um, but as the women return from the spices and they have this interaction with these glowing men, these angels, and the, he says, he is, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. They begin to believe just a little bit, just enough to go back. So they go back and they tell the apostles and the apostles are still in this room, right? And he, she says, listen, this is what I heard. And you would expect in this moment for them to be like, it's true. But they're like, it's a tale. It's an idle tale. There's no way. There is no way, but Peter has just enough faith, right? He has just enough faith to get up and to run to the tomb. And he peeks in and he sees the linens and all he has right now is marveling. There's just this sense of like something's beginning in Peter. And you see, it's almost like a seed that was sown, like a seed that was sown in through Jesus in Peter's life for the first time just begins to break through. And you're like, something's growing in Peter. And so Peter then, the next time that we see Peter's interaction with Jesus, where it says Jesus went and was among the disciples, but I think John makes a very specific point of not mentioning Peter's name again until this interaction between Jesus and Peter in Galilee. So Peter is on a boat in John 21, 7 through through 8. And at this point, Peter's gone home. So Peter's like, I'm going to go back and do what, what, what I'd always done. So he starts to fish. And he says, I'm going to go fish. Literally, this is how it says it. I'm going to go fishing. And the disciples said, we'll go with you. So they go out on the boat. And one of the disciples, John, sees, sees Jesus, who's told him to cast the net on the other side of the boat again. And in verse 7, um, this is Peter's response. It says, that disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore, said to Peter, it is our Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the nets full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards. The first thing I was telling my father-in-law, the first thing you got to see here is Peter's an athlete. A hundred yards is a solid swim. Um, But he jumps off the boat and he goes in and there's this like response. Like it's like a reflex for Peter. Like he had, there's this seed that was sown about truth in Peter and it begins to grow when he sees the linens in the empty tomb. And the moment that he sees the resurrected Christ, it like bursts forward and he jumps out of this boat and he just starts swimming. A hundred yards and he arrives and something happens in Peter. Something happens where there is, um, there's an interaction that Jesus has with Peter, and he just continues to drive his faith home. But what I want to point us to is Acts chapter 2. So the very next book, as we follow Luke and we see these, these stories told about Jesus, the, very, the book about the beginning of the church, the first person to stand up and proclaim who Jesus is, is Peter. And this is what he says at the crux of his argument. In Acts 2.29, he says, brothers... I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in it. His tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would send one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up. And of that, we are all witnesses. Something happens. Something happens with Peter where he goes from, I'm not sure about this, something that's growing, to now he's standing before what turned out to be about 3,000 people that came to know the Lord, that he says, we are all witness to this. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. He was dead, and now he's here with us. And so, we're going to start with story. And I wanted to work my way into, I think it's helpful to grab, sometimes just to grab one individual out of the story. Um, Peter, Peter has a unique place in, within the disciples. And so the question that was put on the table for us today is, why does Jesus have to come back to life? And what I want you to do, what I want to do together, is I want to sit and I want to let Peter answer that question for us. 
um, because Peter has an incredible ministry post this moment where God does a lot of things in his life. Ultimately, he goes through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, which is a lot like the life of Christ. But as he's, as he's in this ministry, he writes and he speaks many things. And one of the things he touched on is the resurrection, many times. And this was his explanation for it. So if you have your Bibles, you go from Luke 24 to 1 Peter 3 through 4, 1, 3 through 4. Uh, if, you're, if you have one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 588. So he's writing this letter to encourage a dispersed community of believers. Um, and his encouragement rests on hope. Uh, it's something that our world is desperately in need of. Let's start reading. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. This is his explanation. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. So if you were to ask me, what is the answer as to why does Jesus have to come back to life? Peter says, because if he does not, then we lose all of this. But because he, if we pull out one statement, that Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we lay it as a foundation, you now see him begin to build. And what he builds on it is that there, because of that, we are born again to a living hope that lasts for eternity. He builds something. And without the resurrection, every bit of it falls apart. But with the resurrection, every bit of it leads to hope. So let's, let's return to the beginning. The the first thing that we're going to see just in this passage is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us new life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us new life. Um, so from the time that, uh, from the beginning of the Bible, uh, one of the, the message in the Bible that presents is not that we are not physically good enough, uh, but that we are spiritually dead. And I think there's a difference because I think there's a lot of messages that we, we receive today where the idea is that we could be something if we would just try harder. And I think it's tempting to look at Jesus. I think it's tempting to look at all of the scriptures and to have this feeling in you that I, if, if I could just try harder, maybe I would look more like Christ. The reality is, is that all of this, the message from the beginning is that we are dead. Um. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. He says, And when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all once lived in the passions of our flesh, crying out to the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. This is the message. Um, Jesus did not come into this world to make you a better version of yourself. Praise God that that is not why Jesus came. Um, Jesus came into this world so that you would have life. And he uses this word, born again. Born again. Um, he's, those aren't his words, those are Jesus' words. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, and John captures this again in John 1.12-13. In the very beginning of his book, he says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's this idea, something's happening. You're being born again. And one more, John, 1 John 1, 5 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. The idea is that you would be born again, and that is, that's different. It's a different framework and understanding of 
the life that we have been given. Um, this is the reality is that we don't need someone who can show us how to live a better life. We need someone who can defeat death. and That's why the resurrection matters. Um, we're inundated every day. It feels like all the time with, from a million different outlets that tell us either one, to be fearful, or two, how to be our better selves. Um, just do this, just try this, eat berries. Like if you eat berries, just berries, you know, for like 20 days straight, it's gonna be great. And I'm just like, I can't do that, first of all. And second of all, like, I just, I, I just don't, in the end, I've seen people going through these things, and this, is there real hope, you know? In the end, is that ultimately what leads to hope? And I think there's this idea of like, man, if we just did that, then, then we would be happy. And I think what we see is that, no, the, the truth is, and what Paul goes on to explain, is that God came so that we would, that we would be completely restored that there would be new life in us. Paul continues, like right after he talks about what we were, he talks about what God did. So in Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, he says, but God, he says, being rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. He says, by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages you might show his immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He says, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that anyone may boast. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what I want you to hear today. The very first thing is that what Jesus does in the resurrection is that he gives you new life. So what that means is that your story is not, I used to do this and now I don't do that. That's not your story. There may be parts of that where you've left some things behind and we're going to talk about that and that's beautiful, but that is not what Jesus did in your life. What Jesus did in your life is he took something that was dead and he made it alive. That's the miracle. That is the story that God in his grace, the word is in his mercy, that he reaches down into our brokenness and does something we can't do on our own. There's no striving that would get us there. And the beauty in that is that there's nothing to boast about. Like, what are you going to boast in other than Christ? The fact that he is the one that did all, every bit of it, his pursuit his restoration, and when he goes to the grave, the beauty is that he didn't just take on death, but in the end, death is defeated. That's it, is that on our behalf, death is defeated. And if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus' victory over death displayed in the resurrection means that no matter where you have been and no matter what you have done, no matter sin, whatever sin you have in your life, the message of the Bible is that it has been emptied of its power. The message of the Bible is that not only, we don't only claim that we have power, God does only claim that he has power to forgive sin, but he shows us that all sin can be forgiven and was powerless because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the way that Paul again puts it in Romans, he says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Raised him from the dead. That's what our belief is in because it has to happen. So the second thing that we see, if the first thing is that we get new life, the, res the second thing would be that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us real hope. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us real hope. So the word he says, he says, according to his great mercy... He has caused us to be born again to a living hope um, through the resurrection of Jesus. So hope is something that we desperately need. Um, I was just looking. Uh, I was like, where are we at with, with hope currently? How are we doing? Um, this, this, re this research was done right about a year ago, uh, going into 2022. Uh, APM Research Lab says, heading into 2022, Americans are experiencing high levels of worry and much more temperate levels of hope. That is not a surprise. 84% um, of Americans say that they are either extremely or very worried 
compared to the 42% of Americans who describe themselves as extremely or very hopeful, which is 24%. And roughly one quarter of Americans report that nothing makes them hopeful, while only 2% of Americans say that nothing makes them worried. It's this idea that we are growing in a lack of hope. Um, we talk about hope differently. I think, um, I hope that the Sixers win the NBA Finals, to be honest. Um, I think... I hope that we get to spend some time at the shore this weekend, I mean, this, um, this summer. And oftentimes, hope is something, and when we really boil it down, uh, it's just an optimism. It's an optimistic mindset that is put into something that we hope will work out in our favor. Um, so sometimes these are things that we have in our life where we say, um, yeah, of course, uh, whether it be, you know, I hope that I have a good job. I, I hope that... I can provide for my family. I hope that um, I will live to be like healthy at an old age. And some of these have reasonable, um, there's a reasonableness to them because you have worked to get that job, because you have a resume that says you should get that job, because you have been diligent with the way that you've spent your money and you may be disciplined. So there's a sense that you should be hopeful um, because uh, you eat the right things and you work out. Okay, great. Maybe there is a sense that you should be hopeful for what your health at an old age. But I think this is, this is the problem. What happens when, um, when hope is tested? Um, when the stock market crashes, when something happens that outside, is outside of your control, when you realize when reality hits you in the face and reality says we have far less control than we actually think we do. Um, and so you're a phone call away from someone saying, hey, so-and-so is in the hospital, and all hope feels lost. You're a phone call away from a boss calling you up and saying, hey, I appreciate what you've done for us, but the company is going to have to completely dissolve. You're a phone call away from even your own health or some kind of financial crisis, something impacts, and all the security that you thought you had is just in, in an instant gone. And you're struck with reality, which is, I'm, there's re like, is there anything really that I should be able to put my hope in. And I think the way that we say it here is hope has a secret. Um, it's only as strong as what you put it in. And oftentimes it doesn't reveal that until it breaks. And so I think what you see here um, is that the hope that Peter is talking about is something altogether different. Listen to the way that Paul says it in 1 Corinthians. He says, for I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. I love this. Paul says a lot of things in 1 Corinthians. He says, let me tell you what's of first importance. Let me tell you what is most important. And he says, Christ dies for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And then I love, he says, most of whom are still alive. He's like, ask them. Um, and then he says, though some have fallen asleep, then he appears to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, to one who is untimely born, he appears to me. He's like, you want some kind of proof? I, it's all around you. There are witnesses to exactly what said, was said would happen, happen. That he lived, that he died, and that he came back from the grave. So what we need we need today, um, we don't need a hope that promises a good life. We need a hope that assures us that death is not the end. That is what we need. Um, and it's a proof that is not rooted in optimism, but is rooted in truth. That is the kind of hope that changes you. And what Paul begins, or Peter begins to describe as a living hope. Um, I think um, you don't know the power of hope until you've really, really put your life, invested your life in it. Uh, it's, it's something that um, I, have grown, I have grown to know, um, that there are moments in life where it feels like everything is lost, and there's seasons in life where you just turn around and like, every part of you is like, Lord, but I felt like... Every, it's not supposed to be this way. 
And sometimes death brings it, sometimes it's life circumstances, but I do know that there's moments in life, and oftentimes it's at funerals, where you're just like, all of this sin and darkness is brought into this world, and we've just grown, as Brian said, accustomed to death, and, but you can't, you can't miss that, like, deep in your heart, you, you think, like, why does it have to be like this? It's not supposed to be like this. And the reality is, and what you're struck with, is that you're right. We were never made for that. Like, there is actually a hope that's meant to transcend that. And when you come to realize that hope in your life, it changes the way that you see everything. It changes the way that you see the things that you've been given. It changes the way that you see the relationships that you have. It changes your purpose in the world. It shapes everything about you. I think what Paul is saying, when he says living, he's saying it's not dead. It's certainly if it's, if it's a hope that's not dead, it's a hope that's producing something because the only thing that can produce something is something that's alive, right? So you have this living hope in you and it produces in you something that looks a lot like Christ. It's a beauty. It's a simplicity to it that Paul is calling us to. So our celebration is not only that Jesus took on death, but the celebration today is that death could not hold him. And because death is defeated, hope is alive and well. That is our celebration. As we come into Easter, as we look at a baptismal, as we celebrate what the Lord is doing within our, within our people, within our body, as we look at the empty tomb, you're with Peter, you begin to grow in this excitement and anticipation for what the Lord has done. The last thing that we see the last thing we see is the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us a secure future. Um, so Paul starts this letter. Um, Paul starts this letter by saying at the very beginning, his very first sentence, so I, not sorry, not Paul, Peter. Um, his very first sentence says, Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus, to those who are elect exiles, um, which sounds strange. But what Peter is saying to them right now, he's saying to those that have received the gift of God, and that word exile means aliens. Like like to those that are are not of this world. To those that this, from the very beginning, he's saying, this is not your home. Like this is, if there seems to be some kind of like disconnect here, there's a reason. It's because You were not made to remain here. You were made to be in the presence of the Lord. This is not your home, believers. And I think um, the author of Hebrews says it this way. He says, for this world was not your home. We are looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. Um, What you see is that he says, there is a treasure for you. There's a treasure. There's something that inheritance that is imperishable, that is undefiled, that is unfading. And all of it is built on the idea of Christ and the truth that Christ came and he rose from the grave. Have you ever ever traveled for like an extended period of time? Um, Doesn't, this summer I'm gonna get to do that, which is great. Um, But I think it, no matter how nice the hotel is, by the end of the trip, there's a part of you that is like, this is not my bed. I don't know, I love my bed, you know? Like, this is not my bed, this is not my shower, this is, I'm tired of this room, you know? And I think you can enjoy the trip, and I think you can enjoy a hotel, and you can enjoy a space, but there's a part of you that there's this disconnect of like, I know that I'm not home yet. Um, And I think what we're, that feeling that we have as believers often, in this world, where you're like, man, it feels like every time, every, every time that I live out my faith and as I live for Christ, there seems, to be this, there seems to be this tension, there seems to be this resistance. It seems like every proclamation of Christ is, is met with something, some other, um, another lie. And you're, you're at this point where you're like, man, it, when, was, when is it going to end? Like, there has to be some place. Is there ever going to be a time where death is no more? 
and like there is no more weeping, there is no more tears, and there is no more brokenness, and everything that we long for is just completely satisfied. Is there ever a time that that is, that is all that we're going to experience? Is that when, come, like please, Lord, come. And I think we know this morning that as Jesus takes on death on our behalf, as we see Jesus come out of the grave and we look into the empty tomb, you can be assured that there is a day. There is a day. There's coming a day where there is going to be nothing but life and sin will be no more. The presence of sin will be gone and there will be a beautiful reunion that we look forward to, that it just feels like, Every tension that we feel is dissipated, and it's almost as if the way that it says is as if it never was. Like, like everything that we long for is just completely restored. Revelation um, John, this is how he says it. He says, and I, John, saw the holy city. He says, it's a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. It was a glorious sight, beautiful as a bride as on her wedding day. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, the home of God is now among men. That statement alone has weight. Like from the beginning of time, we were created and placed with God in the garden and that was broken. And from the, the rest of the story is God restoring that. And now again, we have this moment. He's saying, the home of God is now among men. And he will live with them and they will be his people. And yes, God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All of that is gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, see, I am making all things new. Life. You know, that is the statement that you get in the end is that Jesus sitting on his throne at the right hand of the Father, and again returning to this, I am with my people, they are my people, I am their God, and everything is being made new. What a beautiful end. So, um, I think as we transition to baptism, I'm excited for Vince and for Dennis. Um, it's, uh, it's a morning, this moment for us is um, a special moment. Uh, because there is, because this is something that I think Jesus, he steps into the Jordan River and he displays this baptism. Um, but also at the same time, um, he says, there's a baptism that I'm going to endure that you can't. And that baptism is that he was going to be baptized into his death and then he was going to raise to life. And so you have this picture where someone is, someone is baptized and they are taken under the water and they are brought out in victory because it, is, it symbolizes everything that Jesus has done for us. So let me pray for us. We're gonna worship one more song and then we're gonna enjoy the gift of baptism. Let me pray. Father, um, this morning, we, we celebrate. Lord, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that it gives us new life that it gives us real hope, and that ultimately that it gives us a secure promise that there's coming a day that we will be in your presence and that there will be life. Um, Lord, that there, everything that sin has brought, this pain and death and sorrow, that it will be no more. What will remain is you. And so today, Lord, I pray that... Um, Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know that hope, I pray that you would usher that hope into this moment. Lord, I pray that there would be um, real life uh, that comes from the death of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Lord, we're, we're grateful for the gift of baptism. I pray that as we celebrate this, that you would be glorified. Um, Lord, everything that we do is an act of worship to you. And so, Lord, this is worship, and we're, we're grateful just to be in your presence. In your name, amen.